Hello. This is Friday, June 30th, 1995, as part of our continuing celebration of the 50th anniversary of the conclusion of World War II. We uh, continue on with the project of interviewing veterans of that particular war. We have with us this morning Ernie Gerard, who is essentially representing the U.S. Navy. You didn't realize you were going to be representing the U.S. Navy. No, I, I didn't get okay from Washington. I didn't <laughs> Fortunately, there are those things where we don't have to get okays, we just go ahead and... Okay, yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Mr. Jard, can you tell us uh, where were you born and, and raised? I was, <clears throat> excuse me, I was born 194 East Albany Street, which is, uh, the house is still there today, and it's owned by my cousin, and uh, I, was, I was raised down mostly, um, short two blocks away from there, and I, um, we moved uh, to the corner of, uh, let's see, it was uh, Lawrence and 12th Street, Lawrence and Alma Street today. And uh, um, I went to Oak Hill School, from there to Fitchu Park, and uh, from there to Oswego High School. Uh, I must have known you from Oak Hill or Fitchu Park. Yeah. You have to be yeah, one or the other. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, when did you first enlist in the service? Yeah, well, as it turned out, um, I went into the, <coughs> excuse me, I went into the Navy in 19, uh, September 10th, 1943, and um, which uh, I was inducted, I, I believe, in, uh, in Albany, and from there went to Sampson Naval Base, which is up on Seneca Lake. And uh, I went through boot training, what we call boot training, which is uh, recruit training, and from there I went to to uh, Samson. Um, we used to call it Samson Tech <laughs> <laughs> Signal School, which was held there. And uh, after I think it was 16 weeks, uh, went to uh, Little Creek, Virginia, for more for amphibious training. And after uh, we <clears throat> received our am amphibious training there, uh, we went down to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, to pick up our ship, which was the LSM Landing Ship Medium 137. Okay, now in order to do all of this, you had to leave high school, is that right? I didn't say I left high school today. No. no. Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, I, Inter interrupted high I, school. I, I, uh, yes, I left high school before um, so my high school was interrupted. Um, I left high school and went into the Navy. And um, that's what, and then that, that was uh, the sequence of events. Mm -hmm. And then of course after the war was over you went back. After the war was over I came back and, uh, and uh, finished and finished high school. Uh, during my early life I had uh, a series of uh, sicknesses and uh, which kind of set me back in school a little bit and uh, so I didn't uh, I was a little older and uh, so I, when the time came I went into the Navy and, and uh, so I came back and I wanted to finish and so I did. Mm -hmm. Now after you left Little Creek, Virginia uh, for your training you went picked up your ship. Yes. And that was in Charleston, South Carolina? Yes, mm -hmm. at the, right in the, in the shipyard. Yeah. yeah. So it was brand new? Brand new. We were out, We outfitted it. Oh, terrific. Yeah. And we weren't too good at outfitting. I mean, <laughs> we had, that was our first ship that we outfitted. So, uh, but we, di we did it. And it was just one of those jobs that uh, you were tossed into it. And uh, fortunately, we had... Uh, I think our captain was probably the only fellow that had very much training. We did have um, two or three enlisted men that had previously been in the Navy and knew something about what things should, how things should be. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but they were all, they were all good workers, and uh, we got things done lots of times that bef uh, we made our captain smile because. We, remember one time we had 20 tons of ammunition to load 
and we carried it across another ship and loaded it in our ship before they were done. And he yeah. really, he really got a kick out of that. He said, yeah. "Well, I got some good fellows that go aboard this ship yeah. that have," and everybody did it. I mean, even to the yeoman, everybody turned to and, and worked. And uh, they were a good, uh, a good bunch when it came to. They had a lot of them had been had uh, worked in mines in Pennsylvania, and they knew how to work. They were they were good. They're good, good people to work with. Mm -hmm. Now your ship then went from South Carolina to the Pacific. Uh, yeah, first we we made a trip up from South Carolina up through. Uh, <clears throat> I got take a throw a passenger here. Mm -hmm. uh, so we made what, what's called a shakedown. Shakedown. Yes, yeah. right. and we went up back up into uh, Chesapeake Bay, and we ran into a. Well, of course, most people uh, back in those days, it seemed like you always ran into um, a storm off North Carolina. Uh, the name leaves me right now. Hatteras. Cape Hatteras. Cape Hatteras. Yes, Hatteras. That's, the, that's the one. And uh, so we, we went up through there, and we, then we did run into a hurricane up in uh, um, Chip um, Chesapeake Bay. And that kind of, we, Got to be more. We got to be more veterans as far as handling the ship. Caught on fire one time. Got the fire out all right. Mm -hmm. And um, we just were gradually learning to do the job. Mm -hmm. And everybody was learning to do their job. As I say, there was a. Well, we had a storekeeper, and a, a yeoman, um, a pharmacist, mate, um, deck. Uh, one of the, our acting petty officers on a deck force. When the acting chief petty officer, rather, uh, some of these fellows had done these jobs before. So fortunately, they they helped the rest of us. Who, our communications department was all new, and uh, our gunners our gunners mates were all new. It sounds like you had quite a shakedown cruise. We did. We did have a. But we, came through with yeah, flying That's right. We came, that's right. We did. We okay. came through. We didn't have any. We didn't uh, have any bad accidents, and uh, you know, we did. And, and we, then we came back down and went down through. The <clears throat> down through, and we touched on. Um, we finally uh, found out that we needed a cover over the conning tower, and we got down to Cape, to Key West, Florida, and they didn't have any canvas, so they went to uh, ashore there, and they uh, picked up bunch of lumber and they built a covering over the top of the conning tower, conning tower out of lumber. And one of the fellows said it looked like a chicken coop. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, so we had a lot of fun about that for a while. There weren't too many things to have fun about in those days, only what you made yourself. And uh, this, is, uh, this was, uh, fortunately, we had a, a good group that that uh, could, uh, we had a good rounded group that could have fun about some things and and uh, it made the best out of a kind of a poor condition. I mean this thing wasn't the, wasn't the easiest thing to have to do. Oh, I forgot. Well, when we went, uh, we got up to Chesapeake Bay, then uh, they pulled us in there at Norfolk and we were tied up there for Oh, maybe a week, week and a half. They're waiting to see if they needed us at Normandy, and as it turned out, they didn't. <clears throat> I was hoping they did, but they didn't. And we went to um, they were to go to Japan. I'd rather have gone over to the other side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you got to Key West, Florida, built the chicken coop. Yeah, <laughs> and then, then, then we proceeded and we went to the Panama Canal, oh. and we went uh, went through the through the Panama Canal. Had one night of liberty in, in Cocosolo, and uh, then we went uh, through the canal back up to um, San Diego. Mm -hmm. And we got in San Diego, and they were going to give us some more training. We went to school there, spent one morning in the school, and we said, We know all this sort of thing. We've had this all time and again. Of course, they didn't know that. and. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the instructors at the school didn't know this, so we got taken out of there and then we went to uh, uh, 
um, San Pedro. In San Pedro, they took off two 20 millimeter guns on the front of the ship and put on a 40 millimeter gun, which was a bigger gun, mm -hmm. and uh, which is much safer to use than the, than the 20 millimeters. The 40 millimeter would go in the air, and then after a period of time, it would explode up there. It didn't have to come back down to explode. Mm -hmm. So then we picked up our cargo and went to uh, the Philip. Uh, no, we went to uh, yeah, Oahu. Oh, okay. Yeah. In the Hawaiian Islands. In the Hawaiian Islands, we went to, and, and we were there. We went, and I saw where the oil had run up the ba the banks from uh, from the day that the the Japanese attacked it. That place must have been something. Uh, because there was oil for many feet up the banks that you could still see is there. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it can't be that it hurt the environment an awful lot of you we'd have heard about it, right? Uh, you know? Now this would be uh, 1940? 1944. Okay. Yeah, and what month would this be? Uh, somewhere in the area of um, October. Somewhere, uh, somewhere in October, November. I probably. This is, this is, the point is that yeah. this is almost three years after Pearl Harbor. And yeah, yeah, and it's still there. Yeah, well, you know, it was still there at that at that mm -hmm. time. I thought maybe it might it might be. Uh, uh, no, no, mm -hmm. I might have it. Uh, I could, I could. Uh, well, I was trying to get just a rough approximation okay. of how much after. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Here we are. Yeah, this would give us the time here. Okay, 24 October, yeah. arrived at Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see there, there is a, there is a, all right, so we can use this. And then, how long did you stay there? Oh, let's see here, it was, we were there. Until November, I think. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't too long. We were, we were there, and um, November, uh, departed alone for the South Pacific. Oh, we did. Not in a convoy. We, this, no, wait till I tell you a story. We st we started off with a convoy. Uh -huh. We got off. We got out a few few miles, and I heart, heart, the hydraulic coupling on one of the engines uh, went out, and we had to go back and to get fixed. And then we went out by ourselves. Then we started. Then we started alone, and I'll tell you that's a little bit. That get to be a, a, a little bit um, um, hairy. We'll call it because mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we were there all by ourselves. One one time I remember we got called the general quarters. See a plane coming, as it turned out to be ours. Fortunately, mm -hmm. one of our PB PB uh, PBYs. Probably wondering what you were doing out there by yourself. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that's that's the story. Yeah. yeah. Now, how seaworthy was this craft? Was it? Well, I think uh, we were about three eighths, three three eighths of an inch thick, which isn't an awful lot. Mm -hmm. But um, it uh, it took. We had a, you didn't go through the waves. You went over the top. Okay. Uh, they just it, it rolled right over the top of everything. And fortunately, being a landing craft, we could we could go up on any beach. And uh, of course, uh, coral reef is tougher to uh, coral is tougher to go on than sand. But we could we could do it, and uh, we did. We used to beat up the propellers sometimes. Um, they had big nicks in them; they had to be fixed. Um, but we uh, we did. I guess what I really was wondering about was how seasick did people get on this craft? Everybody. Uh, Except yeah. one man, I think there was one man that didn't get seasick. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know what the story was, but he, and uh, even the captain, and, and uh, even the captain got seasick. Was so, it was it a very fast ship? Eighteen knots was uh, our top speed, which was fair mm -hmm. for a smaller ship. We were we were faster than an LST. 
Now, before we started taping, you told us the dimensions of the ship. Uh, yeah, two. Uh, I think it was 206 foot long, 33 feet wide, and uh, we were uh, from the top of the radar to the to the water were, were 55 foot, and uh, we uh, do three three foot forward of water and six foot aft. Mm -hmm. um, all I can think of, Ernie, is that our ship is so small and the ocean is so wide. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that yeah. must have been that feeling. Yes, that is true. And I'm going to tell you, and when <clears throat> you separate from a convoy to go in for a landing, and there's only four of you, you get smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so your first destination was going to be Guadalcanal? Yep. And the first one was, uh, we arrived on uh, the 18th of November, we arrived at Guadalcanal and it, um, uh, anchored off a place called uh, Tagamo Point. Um, we also uh, sailed to the Russell and the and Florida Islands and discharged cargo. Um, then uh, the 21st we went over to um, Bougainville Island and uh, uh, of course, the the Japanese were still uh, were still on some of these islands. Uh, just because we were there doesn't mean that they left. Mm -hmm. They just stayed to themselves and uh, didn't make themselves available. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, the was Guadalcanal been invaded by the time you? Oh were yeah, oh yeah. When okay. we were there, they were, they were what you might call us. And then the stage is being secure. Okay. But, mopped uh, up, I guess. Ma but no, not the mopped up part. Oh, okay, not because, yet. No, no, <laughs> okay. no. They, uh, I, I used to have a, ho a hobby of, not a, 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 a habit anyway of, uh, I like to get out away from things, and uh, I, I've always liked to, to look around. And one time I jumped down into a foxhole, and I, uh, the boys, the rest of the crew was playing ball and uh, it was a little too hot for me to play ball I figured it so I, I I dropped down in this foxhole and I looked around to get the general perspective a, a soldier would get looking the situation over and I thought to myself at that time I said I better get out of here because these uh, Japanese weren't all, all out of that area at that time uh -huh. and I could have got shot and nobody would ever know where I was uh -huh. you know, because they weren't with me so uh -huh. What, what did you do at Guadalcanal? Oh, we just shuttled uh, equipment back and forth and so forth. But at Bougainville, we picked up um, two picked up two bulldozers, um, the big biggest that the army had in those days, and and uh, five tanks and um, three ducks. And on the ducks, we had two. Um, Two Piper Cubs that to use, be used for reconnaissance at the invasion of uh, Lingayen Gulf. Mm -hmm. And the ducks were these amphibious vehicles, right? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, they were an amphibious uh, type vehicle. They were a little bit bigger than a jeep, and they had a propeller that would allow them to uh, go in the water. And uh, they didn't have too much freeboard on them. But they, they were, you could only use them in a the harbor because uh, we'll say it. Three foot wave would run right over the top of them. Uh, right, right. What was it like uh, <clears throat> when you were on the ship uh, between islands um, or for long periods of time? What, uh, what sort of things uh, would you do on the ship? Well, all visual communications and some voice communications. We had radio. Uh, we had a radio for uh, at, at at night. We didn't do, and uh, uh, unless unless the, the place was really secured, uh, we we never um, would shine a light at night because that was just a, a focal point for uh, Japanese to a bomb or uh, to because they uh, though they were somewhat secured, they'd still send a plane over now and again. And uh, we'd still have to stand general quarters. Um, it was um, 
underway, um, I stood a, a watch, what we would call a watch with a shift, and uh, you, you were on four, four on and eight off, or four on and twelve off, depending upon how many people we had involved. And uh, you used to do, um, um, take care of all the visual communications, also do the dead reckoning on our navigation, um, and uh, plot the course. Um, for the four hours that you were on that you were on duty, and um, make available the information to the officer of the deck, uh, the, uh, the various things that you were going through, and um, record all weather. We had um, there was quite a few. Uh, even when we were anchored, we had 19 different. Um, uh, things to record every half hour, mm -hmm. so which kept us pretty busy. Mm -hmm. So, and this, these reports went to, were then copied into what's called us. They were copied into a, a rough deck log, then they were put into a smooth deck log, which was sent to Washington. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we had gotten to the point where you were ready for the invasion of Luzon. Yeah. Could I be excused for just a minute? Well, sure. Of course. Okay, well, uh, after Bougainville, uh, where you, you, you loaded, uh, where you loaded on tanks and the bulldozers and the ducks, uh, where did you go after that? Uh, we went up to uh, Markham Bay and uh, Boona Roads in, in New Guinea and made, uh, uh, did a rehearsal for, for landing. Uh, the fellows that the, in the army that was on board that was operating the tanks, they had been already made some invasions, and they were old hands at this thing, and uh, so they knew they knew just what they were to do, and uh, so then we went after that. Uh, after uh, we went to New Guinea, we came back to Manus Island, uh, and uh, and we uh, uh, formed get ready to form a convoy to go to Lingai and Gulf. And uh, December, the 27th of December, 1944, we're underway on the sailing towards uh, orders towards uh, Lingay and Gulf, uh, Lingay and Gulf and, uh, Luzon, and the Philippine Islands. And uh, it was quite a, a, a long voyage, which took our convoy uh, into the islands. Um, and then. Uh, we were, uh, the 7th of uh, January 1945, we made the first convoy with uh, worst, the first contact with the enemy at, at sundown and uh, several Japanese planes made an attack on the convoy's starboard side and uh, 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 we got to apparent uh, two planes were shot down, possibly uh, one damage. Uh, to one of the sh one of the ships, and uh, on, the, on the eighth we got more uh, we had more attacks coming, and uh, on the ninth of January we arrived in the morning early in the morning at Lungayan Gulf, and uh, then we came uh, we came in and uh, got close to shore, but we didn't uh, uh, make a beaching until 10 a.m. at Lungayan Gulf. Okay, okay. And then at 10 a.m. you pulled up right to the beach and uh, yeah, well, unloaded. <clears throat> before we got to the before we got to the beach early in the morning, we un we unloaded the the ducks that we had on board, and they took the uh, the aircraft that was on them and uh, went ashore and uh, put the wings on the the aircraft. The wings were folded back to make it possible for them to travel on the ducks. And get in a board ship, and uh, then they went ashore and put the aircraft together, and went on re uh, reconnaissance missions. Mm -hmm. And uh, they used to uh, stop back and visit with us a good many times. Uh, of course, they were on on board our ship uh, over a month, and uh, we got to know the fellows real well, mm -hmm. and got to be uh, sort of uh, 
friends. And uh, so anytime that they wanted to uh, stop for lunch, why uh, we were, they were invited to come come aboard, and they would, of course, uh, with a Piper Cub, the beach is a landing strip. So okay. if we were on the beach, they could <coughs> pop in for lunch, huh. drive right up to the bow, and walk aboard. Yeah. And, and they were, uh, they uh, they had a, we had a very good uh, relationship with the army in this particular uh, way. So it only took a short amount of beach for these. Oh yeah. Cubs to take off. Oh right? yes. Oh, it's very a very short distance. I don't know exactly how many feet it takes, but the beach were hard, you know, and they and it was on a slight angle, but uh, uh, they could they could land and uh, and land and take off, and they they'd pop in. We'd have lunch while we were sitting there on the beach, and uh, then they'd leave, and uh, and they did the same thing with dinner, and any other meal that they that they wanted to come ashore. They were, they were always welcome. We always had enough. And uh, there, was, there was only two or three people that would be coming anyway. Yeah. Now, this landing was accomplished without much opposition. Uh, yeah, we, we there were a few a uh, few things that did happen uh, there. Uh, uh, they dropped a uh, there was a, a few mortars and so forth. Uh, uh, we had uh, one bomb was dropped off of our port bow, inflicting only one casualty. And uh, he he was taken off, and uh, he came back a few days later. And uh, uh, we were one time when we were we were leaving when we were leaving the beach one time. One of those big combers come up, and we nearly flipped us over. And uh, I remember I was standing probably three feet from the from the. Uh, um, gunnel uh, of the ship and the, uh, it, it hit me right here. I was leaning so far over that it hit me right here. So it was up at, at probably that angle. Mm. Pretty near tipped over but not not quite. Mm. But uh, we all, uh, fortunately we all had our life jackets on. If, mm. if it had tipped over, well then we'd have, we'd have bobbed to the service probably. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this is what happened. and We happened to hit it exactly broadside and it, it really Got everybody wet, because some of it did come come over, and got everybody wet. There was a lot of fun about it, but it yeah. could have been serious. Yeah. 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 Now, while you were in uh, on Luzon, did you manage to put into Manila? Or? No, no, we didn't go near Manila at that time. We just worked back and forth uh, around there, and we didn't get we didn't get uh, uh, around. Uh, Manila. We were on uh, some of our duties. We went to Ormac, and then we went to uh, uh, on, the, on the west coast. To, uh, uh, on the west coast, then we went over to Leyte, and uh, so we spent a, a lot of time picking up cargo and moving it around in various in various areas. And then um, we're uh, getting ready to uh, to make the invasion. Uh, to uh, Okinawa. Um, on the uh, 25th of March, 1945, uh, we, uh, we picked up uh, uh, medical forces of the Army uh, and uh, a group of ambulances and uh, other, uh, uh, other uh, type medical equipment and got ready to make the invasion of uh, on Okinawa on April 1st, 1945. Uh, it's, uh, we had a rough sea passage and uh, uh, going up through there, uh, the, uh, it wasn't, it, it wasn't a, an easy passage. Um, the, uh, It was a, quite a few days after we got there uh, that before we could unload. I think it was 12 or 13 days after we were there that we were able to uh, unload our uh, troops because they couldn't couldn't get ashore. There was too much action on the shore, mm -hmm. and right there from our right from our ship, I could look over and see them uh, see them using the. Uh, 
uh, flamethrowers. So they were right there. Right. You know, this Observe the, uh, the small arms fire and the, and the uh, uh, flamethrowers and everything right from where we were, uh, and it wasn't too far away. Fortunately, we were. They didn't decide to turn on us, or we would have had our hands full for a while. Huh. And uh, then, after while well, we were working, we were. Uh, uh, whenever you're uh, in an invasion area. You carried anything from uh, pork and beans to 16-inch shells. Everything that was needed to to go from one place to another. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it was from ship to ship. Sometimes it was from a cargo ship to uh, um, uh, battleship. Mm -hmm. We'd we'd transfer uh, transfer shells uh, to a to a battleship, and you rolled them down the deck like you would barrels. You know, uh, don't hit. Uh, don't have the, yeah, the, nose <laughs> the, the nose is on, you know, but uh, but uh, that was that was part of the job, uh -huh. and it was it was hazardous, it was quite hazardous, uh -huh. and uh, uh, but we took that in stride, and uh, would you also transfer uh, uh, everything from pork and beans to ammunition? Uh, to someplace on shore. Oh yeah. You, oh sure. Yeah, yeah. We we handled uh, we handled mortar shells and uh, and various things like that. In fact, one night I remember we had on a uh, we had on a, a load of uh, uh, of uh, aircraft uh, um, gasoline and a, on a load of mortar shells. And that night we they didn't send the army usually sent an unloading party and they didn't send an unloading party that night and it was coming. And we usually had uh, 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 air raids after dark, and we were quite, we were, uh, our deck was volatile. Mm -hmm. So that night we took, and everybody got into the act, and we rolled the barrels off into the water and up the beach ourselves, and uh, took off the, and uh, our engineering officer checked the, uh, uh, the weight of the, uh, the, the specific gravity of the uh, mortar shells and found out that they would float and uh, in the cases that they were in <laughs> and we floated those all out. Wow. So we got got out of it and managed to clear because a stray shell sometimes if it landed in that area would put us to, into an inferno. Wow. And I had seen uh, on a number of occasions uh, am our, uh, ammunition barges and also uh, uh, ships uh, and uh, gasoline barges catch on fire, and uh, they just lost the whole thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, people would get away from it, but uh, they were, uh, I mean, you could see them swimming in the water until somebody picked them up, mm -hmm. because if one shell hit, then it would, it would uh, start a fire, mm -hmm. and then, uh, then the fire would spread, the fire would spread to the rest of the barrels. I've seen a 50-gallon barrel take right off and go through the, through the air, 30, 40 feet. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Because of the, the gasoline pouring out of it and the force of it, you know, mm -hmm. sort of thing. it was a regular small explosion. Mm -hmm. Talking about uh, the oil, uh, tell me before we were on camera about uh, how when you were in harbor uh, that there would be smoke that uh, if you knew enemy planes were flying over, that, that uh, there would make kind of a smoke to cover the ship. Every every evening when we were overseas in a in a a, a battle area, we had a, a a machine on there that uh, was about the size of a Harley Davidson motorcycle, and that was I always thought about it, about being the same size and it had ways of moving it and so forth, and it would start it would start it would start, it would make smoke, and this this smoke would go out and cover the whole area. Now there was a number of other ships that had these. Uh, had these machines also, and it would cover the area with smoke, and uh, and this would go up in the air probably 50, 60 feet or so, and it would stay there for some period of time, and um, then uh, at that time when you're in the harbor, it would be difficult for a Japanese plane to come over and to bomb us sitting there uh, at night. 
uh, with, the, with the smoke covering the area like that, they couldn't tell um, what, uh, where we were. And uh, they knew they were in there somewhere, but they, there was a lot of other area in there that, where there wasn't anything, so they didn't bother bombing until they knew somebody was there. Mm -hmm. One time, off of the shore, on the shore, when we were on, uh, all beached, there were, the, I think there were five ships, five uh, ships of us all beached on uh, Aishima, and the Japs came over and dropped five bombs, and uh, what they, they, uh, they missed us all, fortunately, but they were close enough that, that next morning, uh, when the uh, boys went out to sweep up the deck, they were sweeping up shrapnel all over those, all those five ships wow. were sweeping up shrapnel where it had blown over into the, into our, to our decks. Mm -hmm. But nobody had gotten hurt. Wow. For, we, they could have got, gotten us all as far as that was concerned. But uh, the good Lord was with us. Mm -hmm. Now after the invasion of Okinawa then, you were in the invasion of Aishima. Uh, yeah, well, during, 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 yeah, during the, the it, we took, uh, we took off and went up to, um, we went up to uh, uh, Aishima to help unload some things up there um, with a load of Air Force equipment. Uh, one of the loads was Air Force equipment, and um, with the various uh, islands out there uh, in the, in the in the process. Um, but uh, then we'd go to one island and if they one needed something from there to another island, we would go and bring it. That was our, we were our transporters. That's what we did. We transported. And they could load us, they could load us from the front or they could load us from the top uh, with cargo nets or with uh, vehicles that you could drive on, drive on the, the ship with. Uh, now where did the LMS end up? Well. We took, the, uh, when the, the war was over, we took occupation forces into, into Japan, you know, up into Tokyo Bay, and uh, Yokohama, the city of Yokohama, is located in, in Tokyo Bay. We, un, we had uh, occupation forces, we had some, uh, some good-sized guns, I think there were 155s, uh, a couple of those, and the uh, trucks that pulled them and uh, some other gear that uh, we took and unloaded there um, at the dock on, in Yokohama. And I remember at the time when we went there, I noticed it was awfully cold to me. And I, I said, I'm going to find out. Now we had, mind you, been on the equator for better part of a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, of course, we weren't accustomed to anything cool, 70 degrees. I found out. I went down below, put my jacket on, my foul weather jacket, zippered it up, and went up and it said 70 degrees, and I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> I had never thought it, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, But we had been, where it was so hot for so long, that we got accustomed to it. And uh, then we left, when we left uh, Japan to come back down to, uh, uh, I don't know, I think we were headed for the Philippines again. And uh, we were coming back down, and we got uh, just off the uh, coast of China, and a deep typhoon hit us. And that, uh, at that time, that uh, hydraulic coupling on the engine decided to go out again. And uh, so we lost one engine, the use of one engine. So we pulled in at, at, uh, at Buckner Bay, at Okinawa, Okinawa, waiting for the, to get some uh, work done on us, and at that time we got hit by a second typhoon, and the second typhoon, uh, uh, we were ordered to to leave, but our captain said it would be hazardous to the crew to go ashore, to go out to sea with only one engine that we knew of. If we had problems with that one, we would be at the mercy of the storm. So uh, we waited, and uh, that storm. Uh, we, or of course, we were on the, using our stern anchor, which is considerable in size, uh, probably three inches in diameter or so. And uh, that broke. The storm hit, uh, oh, around two o'clock in the morning. And uh, let's see, it was, um, I think I probably have the, 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 
the date that it hit here, but uh, anyway, it, was, it, it hit around 2 o'clock in the morning, and at 9 o'clock in the morning, the stern anchor cable parted, mm -hmm. and we were headed for the beach. So when we headed for the beach, we the uh, ship went up over a, a coral reef, dropped down in, uh, dropped down into a hollow, and then went up against another coral reef, and we we uh, vacillated back and forth between those two points until it was the the engine room started flooding. Mm -hmm. So we abandoned the engine room, and everybody came up on deck with their life jackets on, and we finally decided to abandon the ship. But we left a force of of, uh, of six men aboard just to take care of anything that could have been could be taken care of. We knew that we weren't going to get, the ship wasn't going to go down too far, but uh, we left the those fellows aboard to to, to uh, take care of anything that they could do. But took the vast majority of the ship off. We had 55 men. We had uh, 50 men and five officers. And uh, so most of us went ashore and uh, went on, on Okinawa and went various places to, to get uh, out of the storm, so to speak. Some of us went into um, vaults and cemeteries that were, the, you know, they were out of, were out of the wind and, and so forth. <coughs> and, uh, and then finally, um, about 11 o'clock at night, we we uh, started walking the roads. The storm let up a little bit, and about 11 o'clock at night, I ran into a, a, a place. Some of us walked up to this uh, this Navy Quonset hut there, and that was the best cup of uh, coffee I ever had in my life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Had it in a bowl, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't have they didn't have anything else there to eat, but they had. Uh, they had good coffee, and uh, so the, the next day the storm let up. And we went back to the ship, <coughs> and uh, then um, there was a debate as to whether we were going to go home or not. And finally, they did send us uh, home. Uh, <coughs> took us off the ship and sent us. Uh, uh, Ashore for a week or two, and then we went uh, we went home, and the, we were arrived in Sandy in San Diego, I think it was, on the first of uh, well, a day before um, New Year's Day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, a couple of days before New Year's Day. So, yeah. so you sailed from Okinawa to yeah. San Diego. Yeah, uh, we they sent us on a, uh, a landing ship. Uh, Dock. They used to call it a landing ship dock in those days. It was about 500 feet long or so. And uh, but we went. Our ship stayed right there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had before we left the ship, we uh, we took a, a lot of the um, um, supplies and things on it that were there off. <coughs> While we sat there on the on the beach, we did have the army loaned us a. Uh, portable generator, so we did have power, mm -hmm. and uh, our crew quarters. The engine room was flooded, so you couldn't get in there. And uh, but our crew quarter, the crew, uh, crew quarters were not flooded, and we stood, we still could live in there. And uh, we lived in there for uh, a short, uh, short period of time before we, they sent us ashore, and then sent us home. Mm -hmm. And that uh, your ship was eventually scrapped, was it? Yeah, it was eventually scrapped, yeah. Okay. And they took the engines off and uh, anything that was that was usable, but not when we were there. Okay. They, they still didn't, they didn't still, didn't get into that stage of while we were there, yeah. Right. Now you were discharged then from San Diego? No. No. Then we went there and uh, we were due what was called terminal leave. We went, to, we went home and then we were, came back uh, to various places and they asked where I wanted to go to and uh, they said Brooklyn Navy Yard and I said no not Brooklyn Navy Yard because I knew I'd gone right back to a ship if I was. <laughs> so I said uh, Buffalo, I'd like to go to Buffalo. I, said, I had an option of going to Buffalo. 
So the, I, was, I went into Buffalo at uh, 7 o'clock in the morning, and at 7 o'clock that night, I was headed for Shoemaker, California. So that, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so they sent me to Shoemaker, California, which was a naval, a naval uh, a receiving station. And we were there for a period of time at the, at the, at the, at the receiving station. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, I was asked whether uh, what kind of a ship I would like, and I said none. <laughs> and because I felt that in the course of time I was due shore duty, in which according to Navy regulations you are. Mm -hmm. And of course they wanted me back aboard ship, being a cyclone with experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, I said I'd rather not. As it turned out, uh, while I was overseas, I had chronic seasickness, but I had gotten it over uh, to a large degree. Mm -hmm. But it was entered into my record that uh, by our pharmacist mate that I had at the time that I had it, I had chronic seasickness. So uh, I didn't, anyway, I didn't get called to go aboard ship. Mm -hmm. Our whole barracks, it was evacuated except two of us. And uh, so we had it. We had it kind of nice, you know. Mm -hmm. This other fellow and I became friends, and we'd go to lunch together and, and, and dinner together, and so forth. And on liberty, and and uh, one day, uh, a um, we had a big voice come on uh, on the PA system that uh, Gerard and this other fellow report report to headquarters. I said, asked him, did you do anything? He says, no. <laughs> I didn't. Know. Did you do anything? He said. <laughs> I said, no. I've been behaving myself. I did nothing. And we got over there and. Fellas said when we walked in, he had his feet up on the, on the desk and he says, Who do you people know? I said, well, What do you mean, who do you people know? He said, Well, you've been assigned a permanent party with, uh, in the Army, which is a ship's company in the Navy, mm -hmm. uh, to the base as processing petty officers. So I said, Nice. But the only thing was, it was only for a short period of time and I was going to be going home anyway. <laughs> but I did have the experience of being able to, to uh, uh, operate a theater, to uh, then uh, to uh, bring men through at the, from anywhere from uh, 50 to 150 every day uh, for a period of time. And we used to process about 3,500 every day and then that kept letting down and letting down and letting down until finally we only had uh, a few oh well, maybe 500 600 or so uh, and uh, every day so that uh, the job become less and less and then i was sent uh, to be discharged and i was discharged from uh, i was sent to lido beach down in new york <clears throat> And I remember at Lido Beach, the day that they were trying to talk to us to, to uh, re-enlist, you would have sworn that Bob Hope was on the stage. And the more this fellow talked to us, the more we laughed, because a lot of us had been that. <laughs> we had heard all the songs that they're, all of the, uh, the messages that they had on re-enlisting, and we wanted to go home. Yeah. So, that was the best place, and uh, we we endured the Navy. Uh, All right. That's going to say, the Navy is a very good place to go if you have to be in the service. I, I think I speak highly of it because there's a lot of different positions and a lot of different areas and things that you could do uh, that uh, would accommodate uh, everyone, uh, everyone's ability. Mm -hmm. But. Um, all right. Now you were discharged from the Navy then? And yeah, we were discharged from the Navy and we went when, home. When, when was that? Uh, April 8th, 1946. Hey, you remember that very well. Yeah, 11 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Can't forget that. No. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Now, now, what of all of your experiences, uh, Ernie, what would you say is the most memorable? Well, it's kind of difficult. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to say because we had so many different things that, that uh, I can't, I don't know if, uh, to, put my, to put my finger right on uh, uh, any one particular place would be difficult uh, to do. I had a, a lot of different chances to learn 
and a lot of things that I was put in a position where um, while I was aboard ship, uh, I, I had uh, the opportunity to learn these things that uh, it kept it kept my interest in that uh, I could have been pretty bored uh, and uh, upset, uh, but I wasn't, and uh, because of the the different jobs that I was given. I was fortunate in that I went to signal school, and when I went to signal school, uh, you had to communicate, and when you had to communicate, uh, that was the ability of conversation, and I think that that has worked with me all of you know mm -hmm. all of the all of, all of my life, and it's uh, it's been an asset. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I didn't think maybe it was at the time. <laughs> sure, sure. That's true. So, you know. Okay. Now, after you returned to the Oswego area, then you went back to high school? Yeah, I went back to high school and bought a new car. Became a member of the class of 48 at Oswego High. Yeah, I became a member of the class of 48 at uh, Oswego High. Uh, I then, um, uh, oh, I went back to a job that I'd had brief briefly. And I decided I didn't want to stay at that job, and I, I so I left. And, uh, and then uh, I, um, I did something that uh, uh, I had taken some salesmanship when I was in high school, and that, that was another good course that I liked. And it enabled me to build up some dry cleaning routes, which uh, I that made the. I had the ability then of knocking on doors and mm -hmm. and uh, getting rejected and not getting rejected yeah. and this sort of thing, mm -hmm. and which uh, it, it it helped me in later life. I fi I figure in that in that respect. In the process, I had taken a civil service test and was on the on the uh, civil service list to go to work for the post office. But uh, in the meantime, I. Uh, I got a, a job with uh, Niagara Mohawk, and by the time that this, it, it came to, by the time that the uh, postmaster called me, I was already in the office of Niagara Mohawk, and I said, I don't think I'll do the post office job, and I'll stay right here with Niagara Mohawk, and I did it for 35 years. Okay. Yeah, in the in the gas department, and I did a lot of different things in the gas department, anything from working with a pick shovel in a bar, and I, you. And, uh, mm -hmm. and back in those days, we didn't have back hose. Mm -hmm. And all of our services were dug by hand, so yeah, it was a tough job. But it, uh, I only hit, had it uh, for a short length of time because a job opened and I was I, I, uh, in the office. And so I, I went to the office, and it was one of the office jobs that um, paid a little better than some did. Mm -hmm. Now, how long have you lived in Scribble? Hmm. Just a little longer than I lived anywhere else right now. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think I've lived in um, I lived in Scribus since 1958. Okay. Yeah, that's when I got married and I I built uh, my own house. Uh, I was the contractor. Mm -hmm. I worked as contractor for my own house and I did my own plumbing and heating and um, some of the electricity and. Uh, of course, uh, and, uh, and the finishing, uh, the finish, I did the finish uh, carpenter work in the house, and uh, with my wife's help, and my wife also helped me with the, with the plumbing. Of course, sometimes an extra pair of hands is always needed. And, mm -hmm. You know, this sort of thing. Yeah. Now, when did you go into politics? 1979. Um, I had talked with. Uh, Mr. Richardson, Ernie Richardson at, at the time, and I said, I want to do something in, uh, in the town government. Well, he said, uh, I think that, uh, I think I'm going to retire, he said, as councilman, or as uh, committeeman. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, um, see, what, see what you can do. And so he, he made, a, uh, made it possible for me to have a, uh, meeting with the uh, Republican uh, committee in the city of Oswego. 
uh, that's where your economy that is. And uh, uh, then after they talked to me for a while, they said, well, do you know what this job entails? And I says, what job is that? And they said, councilman. And I said, oh yes. I says, I've been to town board meetings, so I know what it entails and what has to be done and so forth. And I said, well, okay. And so uh, they uh, give me their endorsement. And so that's what I've been, I've been uh, working since, 19, since 1980. The rest is history. The rest yeah, is right? history. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming yeah. in, Ernie. Yeah. Yeah. We appreciate getting you. Our pleasure. Thanks. Thanks very much. You're yeah. welcome. Glad I could let some light on the subject. Yes. Well, that's yes. very good. good.